All right, mate. It's my pleasure to welcome in the new head coach of Australian Swimming, Rowan Taylor. How are you doing, buddy? Yeah, good, mate. Still got a few months before I uh, officially take over, October 1st. But, uh, you know, in the, in the process of, of uh, transitioning into some of the, the key aspects of the role. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, an interesting time for me. But exciting. Mate, yeah, very exciting, mate. Jeez, why on earth would you want that job? Well, look, um, to be honest, uh, I've been working alongside uh, Jocko on the team the last few years, um, on team uh, with the campaign as, as a, like a, a coach leader. So my role is pretty much to be working with the coaches, the athletes in, 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 in a leadership position on and adding, adding value to the coaches when they can't be with different athletes. So kind of that extra hand on the team. But I've also been involved with the planning and the campaign planning for the team as far as, you know, staging camps and all the bits and pieces that go with the plan. And I think when, when Jocko made the decision he was going to return to the Netherlands, um, it was an easy fit. So it's a 12-month it's a contract uh, for the campaign. So I felt comfortable stepping into it because I'm familiar with the team last few years. Uh, and so that was, that was easy, easy for me to step into it. And I think it's, uh, uh, it keeps continuity and consistency for the team. Yeah, I mean, the only reason why I say that is because, look, just from knowing it from the past and being part of the Australian swim team and knowing the pressure that the head coach is under. I mean, it's a fantastic job. Um, you know, obviously one of the one of the best in in the swimming world. And for you to be the head of of this amazing team with this amazing history and tradition, um, it's a huge honor. So don't get me wrong with that. It's just the, the pressure that comes with it. Yeah. I know, so it's pretty huge. Oh, well, look. I, I, I get it, and, and I, I think someone has to lead the program, and uh, you know, and I feel honored as well. I feel very privileged. I love the environment. I love what it stands for. I want to see it to see. I want to see it be successful. Mm. And I'm, you know, I'm real big on team and uh, and environment for for the athletes to perform, for the coaches to do their job. And if I can help that happen, I'm happy to handle the pressure of that um, and the expectations that come with it. That, I mean, I've been doing it myself as an indi indi individually as a coach. So um, I think someone has to do it, and I'm, I'm I'm privileged to be in the position to do it for the next 12 months at least. Well, look, let me say congratulations. You're the right man for the job. They picked the right guy. I've known you for a very long time, and um, I was very proud of you when when I heard your name announced. I'm just sitting here in quarantine, then this this thing comes up. I get this, you know, notification. I was like, oh wow, uh, Rowan Taylor's the next head coach. That's that's amazing. So, uh, oh, mate, yeah, mate, very proud of you. Um, you know, well, you know, I know a lot about you, but I, I've got a pretty big uh, American audience and, and people from around the world. And they might not know you as well as I do. So just give us a little bit of uh, your background, who you are and, and how you got to where you are today. Well, I'll give you the quick summary. I've traveled the world in my, in my life. I was born in Melbourne, so I was born right here where I am right now. Uh, my dad worked for uh, the Nauruan government. Nauru is a small little island in the South Pacific. It's on the equator. And the, the government had their, their, their government house in Melbourne. So he worked in, in, in personnel in that area. And they sent us to Nauru for three years to live on the island to manage their phosphate mining. So we kind of, that was the first trip away until I was about five. And my dad, through his job in personnel, started, you know, kind of moving up the chain. And he, got, he landed a job with a pharmaceutical company called Shearing Plow, which is an American-based pharmaceutical company. That sent us to Hong Kong. So when I was five, I went to Hong Kong. So I was back and forth from Australia, went to Hong Kong and then ended up in New Jersey and then on to California. So that's a quick kind of geography. Swimming came into my life uh, basically on the island where it was nothing to do but go down to the beach and swim. Um, and then when I got to Hong Kong, I swam the Hong Kong Country Club and I started competing, you know, in the little races on the Saturdays and winning ribbons and kind of, you know, naturally good at it. Um, and then, of course, when we got to New Jersey, I played a bit of soccer, baseball, I did all the sports, but I also swam at the YMCA there in, in Scotch Plains, Fanwood, YMCA, and uh, where we lived. Shout out and to then, them. Uh, yep, a bit of a shout out to them. And then I went to, um, we went to California, we moved to Silicon Valley, dad got a job with a biotech company in, in the Silicon Valley, and I, I met uh, one of the great mentors of my life, John T. Skinner, who uh, um, was my coach at San Jose Aquatics. Uh, well, became the coach at San Jose Aquatics. I was swimming with, the, with other coaches, Craig Dillingham and um, Gordy. Shout out to all those coaches that 
I, I, that was basically where I really kind of started my swimming serious, where I stopped doing other things. So San Jose Aquatics in the early 80s. So I swam under Jaunty with the likes of Troy Dolby and, and others that uh, Troy, 88 Olympian, um, and uh, pretty much swam there. Um, and one of the things that happened while I was swimming there was the Australian team came out to swim at Santa Clara International Meet for the 84 Olympics. So we met the Australian team and being an Australian citizen still, we started chatting and dad started chatting with the coaches. Next thing they were over our house for a barbecue. We had the whole team at our house for a barbecue in San Jose. Um, and at, in that team was Robbie Woodhouse, you know, Ronnie McKeon, uh, uh, numbers of people who I'm very, very good friends with today. Um, and uh, somehow my dad struck up a conversation with one of the coaches about me being a strange citizen. And I, I was a pretty good age group swimmer. I was swimming quite well. Next thing I met the AIS next, the next year on a scholarship, <laughs> visiting scholarship in 85. I'm down in Canberra, right? California. I'm a California kid in, in a sense. And I'm in Canberra for, for a visiting scholarship. So I spent uh, about six months at the AIS in 85 where I met the likes of Gary Barclay and a number of people who are very close friends of mine now who are all part of the industry here. So that kind of planted the seed for me to come back to Australia, but I didn't know that until later. So kind of, I really didn't have a thought I was going to go back to Australia at any time. But when I got out of, uh, when I started coaching, which I went to Cal State, and I went to UNLV for a year and then Cal State Northridge. And I kind of petered out on my swimming and just really uh, did, did the college uh, lifestyle. But I started coaching as a bit of a, the job with uh, Dave Salo at Irvine Nova, another, another big influence. Um, a few of my mates were coaches there, uh, kind of just did it as a, a casual job. But, but that was the point in time in 1991, where I, 91, 92, where I really thought, okay, how do I make a living out of this? Mm. And that's where Australia came back into my mind was, okay, that, you know, knowing friends down there and there was a real serious, um, Swimming is very, very serious part of the culture, as you know, but also the learn to swim industry. So that's kind of what motivated me to come back to Australia was to get into learn to swim. Coaching was a kind of a, a byproduct of that. They kind of fit together. Have a learn to swim program and you can coach. You know, it kind of gives you that, that revenue stream. So that was where I, what I did. I, I came down to, um, uh, I got a job at New South Wales with uh, a temporary job with, with uh, Aqueduct. Greg Hodge was the coach lead head coach there and I, I worked there for a bit and then I found my way down the south coast New South Wales where I opened a swim school and coached and worked there for about six years six or seven years where I started developing some talent and um, I started getting involved in some of the programs the state programs national event camps that's where we kind of met um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then from there, I, moved, I made a shift on Talbot said to me if you really want to be serious you got to get out and learn to swim and start coaching so I made a shift back to Melbourne. So I ended up boomeranging, as we use a boomerang term, back to Melbourne in 2000 um, and set, set up shop with uh, Kerry, Kerry Aquatic, which had a, a big swim school under it, but I was just managing the coaching program there and, and head coach. And that's kind of, I've been in Melbourne ever since. Um, over time with Kerry producing athletes on teams and, and getting those opportunities to have talent come into my program, I kind of really started ramping up the performance piece for myself and really focusing in on, on that aspect. And probably my, my, my um, passion for, for performance uh, environments is really, is really driven by the athletes I have. And, uh, you know, when talent comes in and is really motivated, it motivates me. So i got to create a better environment to ensure they can reach their, their success. So that's where I really narrowed my focus on the coaching. Um, and then Nutter Wadding in 2008 asked me to bring my performance kind of model over to them in 2008. And that's where I made a shift to that club and just truly ran high performance for that eight year period from 08 to, to, to 16. Hmm. After Rio, I, uh, I basically st stepped off pool deck and felt I needed a break because I'd really, you know, like being an elite athlete, I think, you know, you, you got to just, it's, it's 100 percent you committed to the cause and committed to your athletes. I just needed to take a break. I've got young family, three, three daughters, and I wanted to just see where I was at and is coaching. Do I want to continue? Because I can't give another four years unless I'm, I'm you know, feeling good. So mm. that's when an opportunity came up with Swimming Australia, and I started working as a the technical director, basically looking after Victoria and Tasmania, these two states. So there's four, four positions that work together with the national 
youth coach and Glenn Berengen and, and Jocko. And we basically look, we work with our states to make sure that their pathway programs for athletes and coaches is, is properly developed. So that's where I landed. And then how I landed here is Jocko asked me to start coming and being part of the team uh, leadership group. So I, was, I went to Com Games, Pan Pax, World Shore Course, and Worlds last year as, as that position. And uh, <clears throat> so being familiar with the, having been on the team for many, many years as a, as a coach, I was on the team with Jocko's first team in 14. Um, I did do a temporary head coach, men's head coach in 13 when we had that transition before Jocko came in. So I had some leadership exposure. So yeah, I, I just uh, it just kind of evolved to where I am today, um, you know. So that's a short story. I don't know if it's short enough, but <laughs> gives you a little bit of an idea where I came from. Yeah, well, mate, as you're speaking, I can actually hear a little bit of that American twang. You know, some of the words, uh, you know, that I have to say to to yeah. to be heard in America. You know, I live in I live in the deep south in Alabama, so if I speak Australian, I'm, I'm it's like I'm talking Chinese, another language. So I have to kind of mix up my words. And I, and I heard a, a couple of words in there. How close were you to being American and staying American? Well, I had a, I had a permanent residency card there. And at the time, um, dual citizenship wasn't possible. I think around the time I probably moved to Australia, I think you could get that dual citizenship. So my sisters are dual now. They got their American citizenship. But at the time, it was I think I would have had to give up Australian citizenship to become American. Mm. And I, it really didn't enter my mind. I didn't have a, a thought either way. I was, you know, I felt growing up in the States, I really, not until I fell in love with coaching, Brett, that I even thought of coming back to Australia. It was coaching that really turned my attention back to Australia. And then it was the network I had. All of a sudden, there's a network of people I knew, and it was all traced back to my, really, to that exposure to the Olympic team. It's kind of like you look back and think, oh, it's, sometimes you think, do things happen for even who knows? But, um, but absolutely, I, I probably would have, if I hadn't have moved back here, definitely would, would have transitioned for sure, like my sisters have. So, but I had no real thought at the time. Um, I was permanent resident, so I had basically, you know, living rights. You know, I was, I was going along nicely there. Mm. So this this close to you know coaching gold medals for the U.S. and now now we're on the other side, um, you know, and, and it's and it's always been a big rivalry, um, you know, U.S. and Australia, and and that would ultimately kind of be one of my questions is, yep. you know, do you think you you guys can beat the U.S. In, in any Olympics coming up in the near future? Well, it's, firstly, I'd say that that's it's a huge mountain to climb. I think definitely. Um, the, the, the always, as you know, <clears throat> having been on the team, there's always a, a, you know, striving to take, to put ourselves in the best position to be the best. So I would say, without, say, dodging the question, I'm, I'm not sure anything's possible. We didn't know one on, on, on gold medals in, at Worlds. Um, so I think we will always be striving to be, to be recognized as the best. And that, that will be our, our goal. It always is. Our goal is ultimately to perform, I think, really, our main objective is to swim well at the Olympic Games when it counts, to, to perform when it matters. That's really kind of what, we, what we've really been working on, making those conversions from our trials into the meet. And if we do that, we definitely have the talent to, to rival. We know that. Our relays are proof. I think relays show an indication that we have strength and depth. Um, and I think it, it'll come down to, uh, um, to those relays plus – a group of our individuals that are really the talent to, to, to really perform when it matters. And that's our goal. And when, when that happens, I think things can, things can, outcomes can, can be what they be. It's a tall mountain to climb though. I think uh, definitely a big challenge for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mate, I'm, I'm actually moving out to California in a couple of weeks and I was going through some stuff the other day and some books and I actually came across this book oh, on yeah. Don Talbot. Um, you know, he had obviously a, a huge amount of success in the, in the late nineties and then early 2000, 2001. And, and like you said, 2001 was that team that, that beat the U S on the gold medal tally. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of, uh, time with Don as the head coach and there was, there were things that I, I loved and things I hated. And, and then looking back, you think, oh, well, you know, some of that was good. Some of that was bad. I mean, what did you learn from a guy like Don Talbot, let's say that maybe you could take into, um, you know, the position you're going in, maybe, 
maybe some stuff that you'll 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 take from him and maybe some stuff that you'll leave that that he had i don't know tell me about that don was um you always knew where you stood with don that was one thing so i think that that in, in that world in that time it was you know you direct there was directness and you 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 also knew what standards he expected so was, he really had high standards i think those things are important but it's how you actually set the table and create the environment for those you know you, you, the, we're talking about 20 odd years ago where you could be a little bit more blunt and direct as you know and i think you need to um take i love that for me as a coach i love being held accountable i love being um told where i can improve i felt you know when he challenged me um as a coach uh it, it inspired me and motivated me to really look at myself so i i i, I encourage that not everybody can can take that um so but i still think that's an important piece of feedback that we need to be able to provide of as it, as it measures up to what's expected at that high level i never i never went into um a national team environment uh without um really preparing myself i think preparing myself was was really what was expected you had to come in prepared also um you know the the value of um i think um probably relays he was really big on relays he really brought that relay culture back um that that was important i think that's something that we really you know need to continue to drive that you know it's a val to be on a relay team is hugely valuable to not only yourself but to the team um and he really he really kept the team kind of above everything else you know it was really all about the team so your what you did mattered to the team it had an impact on the team not just you as an individual so looking back on don i think for me uh, the, the the memories for me were um he never let me be complacent he always if he even thought for a second that you were a little bit complacent he just he just dig into you about something <laughs> you know the old you know son you haven't done anything yet like you need to continue to perform so i feel like that was that was something that he brought to me but what i'm saying is i think that high standards and really making sure everybody knows what those are were, were some of the things that took away from him i got a lot of you know a lot of little stories where mm. you know i've had some fun fun run-ins with him at different times but 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 all i i always felt like he 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 had he was on me because he saw something in me that's what i always i took it that way i thought if he wasn't giving me a hard time then clearly he didn't think i had ability yeah. so that that's how i felt but what about your leadership style and and your ideas for how you want this to be led obviously jaka did a, a great job over the last seven years and you learn a lot from him and and you were kind of there by his side for many of those years so what do you take from jaka and and how will it be different under you you think well with different people like i think that's the first thing so your individuality you're you know and uh jaka is a super he's one of the most authentic people you'll ever meet like what you know what you see is what you get and how how he presents himself he's very consistent he's very measured um i think he he brings that 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 kind of um brings that to the environment you know he, 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 it's not he's not all over so i love his consistency how he thinks through and and manages I, I saw that firsthand you know how he does that and, and it really it really made me realize that you know being that consistency is really good for the athletes and the coaches to be able to do what they need to do and one of the main things that i that i saw and you know and i i, I did this as a coach myself so i think we matched up really well on this was this is about creating an environment and providing the the environment that allows the athletes to prepare without distractions and the coaches to prepare them without the distractions so when i say distractions it's like let's just clear the way and just let them do what they do best right and this is from leading into so what we're doing now and how we interact with the uh, the coaches in their home programs and the athletes what do you need what what can we provide you that's going to give you the best chance to perform when it matters so what are the things that you need from us what can we provide we're facilitating that on team it's the same thing you know everything that we can do to make it more comfortable and 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 just so you can do what you do best so so for me um i have to manage my relationships with with my staff the relationships with the coaches and the relationships with the athletes around being available being present and being consistent so that they feel they can they can have a have a conversation and and actually if i can't do it i can't do it and i have the ability 
to say, look, Brett, I hear what you're saying, but let me explain these things can't happen for these reasons. And you, you take that on face value that, okay, that's good. Let's move on. So to me, relationships um, and just that consistency. So for me, that's, that's, that's how I'm looking at it is really just to make sure that we do everything we can to help, help those athletes and coaches prepare to perform. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I love it. Um, you know, when I was on the team, one of the reasons why I, I, I stopped swimming was in, it was in 2006. I was 31 years old. I was married with two kids. Um, and I was on a team with, you know, 16, 17 year old girls and guys and, you know, first time that they're still living at home and all that sort of thing. So there was this huge, um, you know, dichotomy between them and me, you know, in terms of where we were as people but the way that we were being treated was exactly the same. How has that shifted over time? Because obviously swimming is now a lot more professional. People are staying in it a lot longer. They're, they're, they're married, you know, they've got wives and husbands and, and, and children these days. How has the team itself shifted around the way that the sport has grown as well? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, 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 look, it's, to me, it's, uh, there's definitely a lot more individuality and ability to have some, some individual requirements in there without without say taking away the ultimate thing is is you need to be a team and the team needs to function at the at the time it needs to function and then there's a time where it can be a little bit more individual or a lot more individual depending on the needs i think um firstly it starts with the athlete leadership group and the athletes having a, ability to communicate and, and talk about their needs and what they those types of things so we can prepare through um, the campaign, we'll call the campaign preparation, we can actually take on board those things. So those conversations are the starting point. Um, and then also the understanding that like there's some things that just aren't possible, you know. But when we have um, a camp, for instance, uh, we, we, you know, we, we welcome uh, people to come in and, and, you know, it's not like it's, it's a quarantine situation, although it could be coming up as we know. Mm. But, but I think for the most part, it's that balance between you know, understanding you've got to make a commitment to the team and the team's got some requirements, but also allowing that individuality to allow you to have, to basically to make you comfortable so you will be preparing and performing when it matters. So for instance, um, you know, having your kids there and having your family there in a training camp and nearby and having that ability to have that outlet is going to allow you to train better. And we know that well, we're, going to, we're going to work to make that happen. But at the same time, when we do get closer to competition, there's a point where we need to really close up and be be operating as a team mm -hmm. so i think you know it's it, you i think you've got to kind of test it out but at some point you've got to kind of everybody's got to kind of agree that this is the team moment this is when the team functions together so um yeah it's 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 uh and, and the dynamics of the team change every you know every year we, we sometimes have different so if we have a more flexible a move of uh, say uh you know adaptable environment we can cater for that so I think that's where we're at now. We're a lot more agile and adaptable to things like this. Yeah. Mate, I told David Marsh, uh, one, of, one of our good friends and, and one of my mentors that I was, I was talking to you, and he just texted me some questions. So I hope it's okay if I, if I phone, in, phone in some questions here. Um, two of his questions. The first one is, what's the biggest obstacle to success for you and, and Australian swimming right now? Well, Oh, am I answering it in this the COVID moment or just let's forget that it's just a moment, I guess, probably. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess we're all facing that, right? But yeah, but, but yeah in yeah. terms of, uh, yeah, maybe forget that. In terms that. of if it's the pure pre preparation for sure. an international meet. Sure. <clears throat> I, think, I think for us, um, it's, it's how, we, how much competition we can get into our athlete. This is my personal opinion mm. and probably a number of ours is – is getting real, real meaningful competition in, in the right times to really develop our competitive um, IQ of our athletes to help them. I think, you know, getting get that type of competition is something that, that we, we need to really continue to explore and find better ways that we can do that. We have good domestic meets, but it's getting the best athletes together more often to compete against each other. That, that's, so it's an opportunity. Mm. It's, not it's an obstacle in the sense that, we're, we're restricted by where we, where, we exist, where we are as a country and how far we are from competition. So to go and compete overseas, as you know, having done Mon Ostrom and these other ones are fantastic. Mm. But to get over there is a big chunk of change and a big amount of time. And the risk you run is going away and potentially, you know, you, you, you race, what's more important, racing or training. So I think that's, that to me is probably the number one opportunity that we have, but it's also kind of a, an obstacle in its restriction. 
Yeah. I'm going to ask you his second question in a second, but I've got one in the middle. So for me, why did you guys decide to ultimately shift your trials? And, and when are your trials for next year? Well, the, the dates are still yet to be confirmed, but I know that it's five weeks before the Olympics. So okay. effectively within that window. Um, look, it's been a discussion for a long, long time, Brett. You know, like ever since I've been, you know, involved in the national program, having athletes involved in that, that and being involved in coach discussions, there was always, there was always a camp that wanted to pursue a, this, this type of trials before real close up to the international meet. And then there was the traditional ones that wanted the long preparation, you know, always keep a long preparation. And we'd have these debates and get, it was real close at times getting it shifted very early on, mm. but you just had tradition seem to be, let's just keep it where it was, even though our conversion rate um, was, was pretty pretty standard you know we did we didn't really have uh, we weren't moving from the percentages of improvement from say trials to to the benchmark meet so what were those percentages around, at the time you you know exact kind of 30 30 30 percent so 30 percent would swim faster from the trials to the olympics yeah we have around that kind of conversion right and those are the kinds of percentages we're looking at like how can we get up to you know 50 percent or whatever just a higher percentage and so this was one of the options to really trial this. And so I think with Jocko and I think there was a, a, a more willingness as a group to, to give that a go because um, to, to really just carry a preparation through, you know, to get on the team and then just continue the momentum all the way through to the meet. And that was really, um, let's, let's have a go. We're going to do it. Let's have a go and see how it works. And so it has been, uh, put it this way, I mean, it's, the proof's still in the pudding. The Olympics are the most important meet. And we still got a ways to go. And, I, you know, and you always can look at other options. For, but for my mind, you know, it's set up. It gives a longer preparation into trial. So we've got a lot longer lead-in into it. So it gives more time to maybe go and get some more competition and get more exposure. That's one of the things I think it opens up. Bigger training blocks, opportunities to do camps, a bunch of other things. It, it kind of gives us more space. Um, and I also think, well, we've had an early, early sample of, of that and we have improved. So there's been a, an improvement there, um, but I still think we need, to, we need to just keep keep an eye on it. So, but our attempt is to, be, is to perform better at the, at the benchmark meet from trials. And this was one of those real reasons to, to, to do that. And this might be kind of, you know, a lead up to the next question that David Marsh had. He, he said, what is your definition for success at the Olympics next year? How do you define success? Well, I think, what we're just talking about to me is will, will be the success is, is our athletes performing better at the benchmark meet than they did at the trials. Yeah. That gives them a better opportunity to be on the dais or to be finals or to get the relays there. So that's absolutely what the process is going to lead us to, to success. And I'll be looking at that. And that's something I always looked at myself as a coach is, is if I got an athlete on the team, I wanted them to go better at the meet. You know, that was, that was it. I want you to swim faster. If you can just do that, you're going to give yourself a better chance. Now, very rarely, as you know, there are some athletes that are this that far ahead of the rest of their competition that they can be a little bit off and still perform, and, and that's acceptable because hey, it's competition. You know, you you know, it's it. No one remembers times they remember who touches the wall first. But for us to get ourselves in a position to have that type of success, we need to get better at that we need to improve that um that conversion yeah mate there's always been this huge pressure back home in australia of of gold medals you know that there's just been this focus on gold and whether that's coming from the media or coming from the the government organizations who are paying you whatever it is i mean it's there but at the same time you know you want your athletes thinking about winning gold so like there's this balance between you know, yeah. stressing it and then not talking about it at all. So, like, how do you find that balance between the two? Well, I think it starts, and I can only use the say my, my experience with Liesl, for instance, for Beijing, okay? So when, when Liesl started training with me and she, we had one conversation about it, and that was the first one. She, she said to me, I would like to win. And I said, okay, let's talk about what you need to do to give yourself the best chance. And that was to swim her fastest swim in the final in Beijing, her mm -hmm. best, best time in the final. And that's all we talked about, the preparation, because you can't control others. So from my mind, um, absolutely, we want our athletes to, to, and they all do, you're competitive animals that want to 
want to win. There's, and it's, it's, it's the, I guess the question is, it's up to the coach and the athlete to really have those conversations. For me, what we're, what we're there to do is to create the environment that allows them to have that best chance to do it. Now, I, I'm, I'm a believer that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious that's what we want to do. We want to, want to have our, we want to win as many things as we can, but we also want to, we want to understand that so does everybody else. Everybody else that shows up at that meet wants to win as well. So there's a whole bunch of people who, want, who believe they can win and want to win. So the conversion rate of number one is going into the meet and then coming out number one is you know, about 50-50, I think. But uh, for me, um, it's, it's, it's an individual thing. Some athletes like to talk about it and some don't. And, uh, you know, I respect that. As a, as a head coach or a lead, in a leadership position, I treat that the same way individually. I, some athletes that I've coached love to hear that I believe that they can win and, and they, they want me to tell them that and they focus on that. And some just would rather talk about the process to perform their best and talk of, of the outcome becomes a little bit too much, um, gets them away from doing what they need to do. Yeah. May, what kind of leadership model do you think you'll use next year? How, you know, in terms of like, let's, let's say an athlete's listening to this who's swimming for Australia right now, what can they expect in terms of the leadership from you? Well, firstly, I'm a big, I'm big on communication and consulting and, and, and collaborating with the group. Um, so making sure everybody's very clear on expectations and standards, behaviors. Um, but at the same time, um, understanding that, you know, you got to be a little bit agile to things. So I'm willing to look at that. So the question is, what can, you know, I'll always be available, put it that way, available and, and consistent um, and, uh, and, and want to ensure that when we look back, we can't say, well, I didn't know I could ask for that or I didn't know that we could do this or I didn't, you know, I want to know everything, but then at the, at the same time, have the respect of everybody to be able to say, well, that's not possible or this is possible. So really just be, be more in that, in that space. I think of being available and being present um, and then also ultimately uh, the, having the relationships of, of communication and, and collaboration helps in decision-making um, in that moment. So, you know, if I can stay objective the whole time, I think I can, I can help make be the best decisions in that environment. What do you think the biggest criticisms are right now of Australian swimming like what you you read the the newspapers and things like that or you know what, whatever's on the internet like what what's the biggest criticism of that that you guys are facing right now um I don't know what's going I mean it's pretty pretty quiet but I think it, it all comes down to performing you know when you know performing on the day at the big meets that that's that you know the Olympics that that's probably if we be it's it's that's the most important competition in the calendar uh, every four years, you know, performing at that time, we've had those successes. We've had times where the perception is maybe we didn't, we should have, you know, I mean, to me, it's getting that right. Um, and we're working on it and we understand that um, every athlete, you know, as you know, is busting their bum to, to prepare themselves and, and, and put themselves in the best position. So I think probably that seems to be the one that, um, that I, that I kind of hear come up um, yeah. and, and I understand it. You know, I understand it. That's that's uh, that's what it's all about. You know, it's like when your footy team doesn't show up on the weekend and to play in the game. You know, you wonder where's the effort. Where you know what's happened. It could be something that you know. Sometimes that happens, but you know the expectation is that footy team's going to perform when when the game's on. I think that's pretty much what I see as as the as the key expectation that I hear. Yeah. Who are your leaders right now in terms of the swimmers? So, you know, who are the, who are the kids, the people, the, the, the men, the women that are leading your program right now into 2021? So our leadership group has um, uh, Kate Campbell, Bronte Campbell, Jessica Hansen, Alex Graham, and Mitch Larkin. They're our leadership group that, that, that has been working with, with Jocko. And, and I've had the last few years, excuse me, um, on team with them. So, uh, and they're doing a fantastic job. Um, you know, they're, they're basically the, the, the conduits between the, the, the team, the broader team, and, and uh, even broader than just the team that goes away, the benchmark meet. They, they kind of communicate with the broader athlete group. But uh, they're the ones that we work with around the needs of the athletes and also um, 
you know, if they need to speak about anything particular, they, they, they've got that open dialogue and they, they do a fantastic job of that. That's awesome, mate. That's awesome. There's others within the team, as you know, hockey, there's people within the team just bring leadership through their behaviors. For me, it's about behaviors. It doesn't have to be the most vocal person. It's someone who just sets a high standard and just goes about their business. That's leadership. And there's a lot of that that I see, which, which to me is, you know, helps set the tone. Yeah. What about me, mate? You have any questions for me? So you're going to California. What are you doing over <laughs> there? I am. Um, I am. I'm moving out of there. I'm, I'm, I've been living in Alabama for 15 years now. And uh, it's, it's been, well, plus the three years that I swam at college. So it's been a total of 18. So I'm just yeah, ready wow. to move, move on. Get some, get some, I need some beach back in my life. You know, growing up in Sydney, miss the beach. Um, you know, so got, heading out there and we'll see what comes up. You know, there's so many opportunities out there and, and, uh, I'm working for fitter and faster. Uh, I do clinic, we run clinics all around the country. So certainly still doing that. I work from home and, and, uh, still be having fun doing my podcast. So, so, what, so coaching's, you know, opportunity more than it's just going to see what pops up for you. You know, I, you know, I'm kind of like you. I was burnt out. Like I did, I did Auburn head coaching for 10 years. And, um, and you know what that's like, you just go full steam. You know, I had, I had a, a women's team, a men's team, and then I had a pro team. So, uh, you know, you, I looked at it as three different teams all in one. And then yeah. I had a staff of 10 people. So it was, you know, we'd go from the college season that would go from, um, you know, basically August through March and then go straight into the international season with the pro team and any of the college kids that wanted to come along to that. And then, um, and then that season would go all the way up to August and you'd get a couple of days off and you'd, you'd go again. So I basically did 10 years straight of just straight work. And so, um, I loved it and, and, uh, wouldn't trade it for the world, but I'd had enough at, at one stage and said, look, I'm, I'm burnt out. I can't keep doing at this at this rate. And, um, and, and, and recruiting on top of that, it was just 24 seven, you know, so yeah. Um, I needed to so, step So away. in this time then, how much reflecting have you been doing? Have you spent time just reflecting so you can kind of sift through and just really pull out those, those nuggets of, uh, of uh, experiences that, that tell you kind of crystallize a little bit of like, I, I look at, I remember Don Talbot, one of the things Don said to me, he said, you're going to be, you're going to be the best prepared coach when you retire. Mm. Yeah. He said, you'll know, you'll know, you'll have it all except maybe the motivation. I think that's the key piece that, you know, you know what it, you know what it takes to do it. And I look back and I think like so many things I did instinctively well, not by design that I would do by design now. And there's things that obviously you, you grow in a part of your personality. And you, but I generally have been reflecting the last three years, which has been really helpful for me to understand what, what different stages coaches are in when I work with them. I think that's been really, I just was curious of what have you, have you been doing reflecting or obviously you probably do, but generally I purposeful and yeah. what have you come up, come up with? Well, I think it's a good question. I think, uh, quarantine's helped all of us reflect a little bit recently. So that's been useful. Um, this podcast has been great. I've been talking to athletes, uh, and coaches from the you know, current time all the way back to the eighties, you know, and I've had, I've had many great conversations with people. Um, you know, and then, uh, and then it was just a, a time where I needed to just step away and just take some time to just breathe again and just, you know, who am I? Who do I want to be? Because I identified myself so often. I was pouring myself into so many other people and so many projects that I just didn't give myself any time at all. So really took time for me and just trying to figure out who I am and, and what I, um, and, and I, and I realized at one stage I was chasing things, you know, I was chasing um, glory. I was chasing, um, you know, admiration. I was chasing victory and, uh, and that became consuming and, and, and that brought out the best in me and it also brought out the worst in me. You know, there were times where, um, you know, maybe, maybe on the pool deck, I was a little shorter than, than I, than I wanted to be, you know, <laughs> and lost my temper at times by, by coming on the pool deck and just being exhausted and being burnt out. And, um, and then there are other times where it really challenged me to dig deep, to, to find a way to get the best performance out of people. And so, yeah, it was a time where it did all that for me, but it certainly, um, I, I certainly needed to find out who I was and just, just take a mm -hmm. moment. And so did that. Um, and that's been fantastic. I'm not in any rush 
to get back to coaching. I don't necessarily miss coaching. You know, um, one of the good things and, and the, one of the bad things for me was, you know, Caesar winning the gold medal in the, in the um, 50 freestyle at the Olympics in 2008. I'd only been coaching two years. So it was the greatest thing that ever happened. It was the worst thing that ever happened because after that, it was, you know, my goal was to ultimately win a gold medal at the Olympics and it happened two years after I retired from swimming. So I still felt attached to it. So when we had this victory, it felt like it was, a, it was, a vic, it was our victory, you know, as much as he wanted, I felt like I wanted. We did it together. Um, and I felt very fulfilled in that sense. And then, and then I spent um, a few years chasing, chasing it again. And, um, but, but realizing that I'd already accomplished kind of what I wanted to. So, so I moved away from just chasing um, the gold medals necessarily. And, and um, now I'm into more of the development, you know, where I'm, I, I've really enjoyed going back to the grassroots and, and doing these clinics all around the country. I'm, I'm coaching, you know, 10 year olds and uh, you know, all, you know, nine year olds all the way up to 18 year olds, kids that just are starting their dreaming and starting their passion for swimming. And for me to reconnect with those kids and those people has really taken me back to why I originally started the sport and why I love the sport and why I'm passionate about it. And I found out it wasn't about the gold medals necessarily. Um, but in saying that after being away for two years, I'm, I'm a highly competitive guy. I always have yeah. been. I think you, you know that about me. I've, I've, uh, I think you've seen the best and the worst in me as well in, in times of competition. I can get, I can get very locked in on it and uh, it can certainly bring out um, those, those can I things. Can tell a Brett me. Hawk story? Can I tell one story to the yeah, audience? Please do. Canberra. I think it was, uh, it was a meet before. It was one of the meet, the Grand Prix meets that used to be run. And I just happened to be down the end where you guys were all marshalling for the final of the 53. And you're standing there kind of pumping your chest, you know, doing your thing, getting ready. And some swimmer, I, can't, I don't know who it was, walked up and asked you what lane you were in. <laughs> you said, what effing lane do you think I'm in, mate? Lane four, the, the fastest lane. And the guy's like, oh, geez. The way you said it was, it was just priceless. It was like, what do you mean what lane I'm in? I'm in lane four. Of course I'm in the fastest lane. <laughs> yes. But, uh, no, I, I, love, I, love the comp I do love the competitiveness. And I, it's really interesting you're saying in, in what you're saying. I just want to. I've done some work with some coaches over, the, over this COVID piece about recreating your purpose. And it really started with a conversation every Monday. I'd have a conversation with coaches on Zoom about, you know, ref, ref, started with reflecting. And a lot of them lost their purpose. They were like, I don't know why I'm coaching. It's like, well, why did you start coaching? And, the, and then what were the things you loved about it? And then recreate that purpose and then go back and make sure your environment allows you to do that, continue to do that because the environment's, everything comes in on you and, and it, and like you said, it washes away your purity to be on deck and just present. And to me, great opportunity for everybody to recreate their purpose, go back on the pool deck and be, be filled with the energy and, and, and the motivation. That is the first thing why you, why you, what you fell in love with. For me, I, I you know, I, I deviated away from that a lot. That's where I started getting burnt out. Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think we kind of went through that probably around the same time, around 16. So, um, uh, listen, Matt, I've really appreciated this. It's been great. And um, thanks for the questions and thanks for the honesty and, and the openness. I wish you nothing but success. I've, I've seen you from, from being a young coach many years ago to where you are today. And like I said, I'm, I'm very proud to know you. Um, I will tell you this, that um, I do miss Australia deeply. Uh, I'm going to ask you, are you coming, can we get you back? Or what, what, you know, you're saying California. Come on, you're getting closer to us. I am getting closer. <laughs> I am. Um, look, I love Australia and nothing would uh, make me prouder. It has been a challenge because um, my – my former my former wife um you know she grew up in america she's she's jamaican but um but my kids uh grew up here basically you know so i've got four children and, and it's, it's tough to to just disappear and go to another country so that that's always been um the issue it's not the fact that i don't love australia and 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 look america's been just as good to me as well but um, so I have, I have a deep love for both countries, but certainly I would love to get back there someday soon. I, I miss Australia deeply for sure. And I, and I love all the coaches that I've had relationships with over the past yeah. many years. Well, well, it's always great to talk to you. You know that and um, always appreciate 
you, who you are and, and, and the relationship we've had and I, it'll continue on, I'm not, I'm, I have no doubt. So, but thanks for having me, it's a privilege and um, I hope I can, um, I can lead, lead our team to a successful uh, campaign, that, that, but it's really up to me to help those coaches and athletes. So I really look forward to that. Well, good luck, mate. Uh, congratulations again and uh, wish you nothing but success over the next 12 months, all right? Thanks, buddy. All right, Rowan, take care, mate. All right, we're good, we're